Hi, it's Dwyer, gamblersadvisory.com, a free site, bettingangle.us, a free site. You remember the 1980s. You remember how it was. A young black man in his 20s, Isaac Hayes Bald, entering the ring with his cornermen, Pat and Goody Petronelli. No smiles. Old school, Rocky Marciano, Massachusetts style. It looked like they were together catching a bus, not entering the ring for a championship fight. In a decade of tassels, MTV died here, George Michael. You had no bells and no whistles. He'd come in and have a stiff jab. He was a southpaw. The jab was his right hand. Short punches behind it. If you wanted to push back, he would push it with you. Whether the fight went 75 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour, 90 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour. From 1980 to 1987, Marvin Hagler held at least two of the middleweight titles, right? Understand, when he fights Duran, when he fights Rodan, when he fights Hampshire, when he fights Thomas the Hitman Hearns, when he fights John the Beast Mugabe, each of those fights were for the WBC, WBA, and IBF titles. Marvin Hagler's reign wasn't just a championship reign. It was an undisputed reign of terror. Let me just say the highest point in boxing <clears throat> is when the public knows you're the champion. The public knows you've earned the championship. And the public openly wonders Whenever a great talent comes along, whenever a great talent decides to enter the division, whether they can beat you. In the mid-1980s, boxing fans knew who the middleweight champion was. He was marvelous Marvin Hagler. Now let me point out that the middleweight division had a history. You know, they say, never try to replace a great man or woman, right, if you want real power, right? I think that's out of the 48 Laws of Power or some book like that by Thomas Green. Well, in the 1970s, we had a great fighter, had huge problems out of the ring, but he was a great fighter in the ring, iconic, one of the best ever in the middleweight division, Carlos Monzon. And he was a tough act to follow. But the one thing he showed you was that several years of dominance were possible. Well, like Monzon, Hagler had some early losses. That Vito Ottofermo first championship fight for Hagler, right? First championship challenge. Hagler's the challenger. I'll agree, Hagler starts to fight fast. But as that 15-round fight went on, Autofermo started roughing up Hagler deep in the pocket. Marvin Hagler, who we assume was the baddest man on the planet deep in the pocket, got roughed up deep in the pocket by Vito Autofermo. Now, I still thought he won that fight. They called it a draw. Let's just say he didn't enter the ring with the belt. It was a close fight. The question for fight fans like us is, did the champion do enough to leave the ring with the belt? Altafermo may have. So then we get to Alan Minter, another Southpaw who's champion. The fight was in Wembley. One of the reasons why Marvin Hagler is one of my very favorite fighters. And I was a child of the 1980s.
was that it didn't matter where Hagler fought. Hagler was simply ferocious. Hagler didn't worry about the crowd. Just much too focused, much too mentally tough for that. So the Alan Minter fight takes place in Wembley. Everyone is rooting for Alan Minter. Marvin Hagler comes out Minter. Has Hagler backing away from the pocket in the early moments of that fight. And then you have complete destruction. Marvin Hagler is hitting Minter with that stiff jab. Marvin Hagler starts throwing right hooks off that right jab. Marvin then starts muscling up Alan Minter. It's a dominant performance. The crowd, the Minter crowd, is so shocked at Wembley that after Hagler wins the fight, Hagler drops to his knees. And while he's on his knees in the ring celebrating his championship, a riot broke out. Fans started throwing bottles into the ring. That's how Hagler's reign starts. He wins the title in the United Kingdom with bottles being thrown in the ring. And I can just tell you, Marvin Hagler didn't care. Did not care. He was in the ring for one purpose. That was to leave with the title. He was not going to have a fight where he beats the champ, but it's close. And he doesn't get the decision. Happened to him again. Or so he thought. Well, let me just say, Hagler fought some great fighters. We should be celebrating the championships of fighters like Mustafa Hamshow, a great fighter. Juan Rodan, folks, he was a great fighter. Look at the number of KOs. Hagler's fighting knockout punchers. Would it shock you to know that during Hagler's middleweight title run, only one guy, before the Ray Leonard fight, only one guy goes the distance against Marvin Hagler. And it's one of the best strategic fights I know of. It's an underrated fight. That opponent was Roberto Duran. Great fight. So, in an interview recently, Hagler wins by uni uh, unanimous decision. In an interview recently, they asked Duran who was the best fighter he had fought. And Duran, this is before Hagler's unexpected death, said Marvin Hagler. Right, And in that fight, it's a chess match. Duran jumps out to a lead. Hagler then starts changing things up a little bit, looping his punches a little bit. They're playing chess for 15 rounds. This is Marvin Hagler, the guy who destroyed people. Everyone else KO'd. His coup de grace was his fight against Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Understand, Hearns had destroyed Duran by early stoppage. Understand, Hearns was winning on the scorecards against Ray Leonard when he gets stopped in the 14th round. Well, the shock of Hagler Hearns wasn't Marvin Hagler. Because understand, the Hagler you saw in that fight was the Hagler you saw in every fight. Simply ferocious. As I said, if you decided to push it and wanted to go 100, He'd go 100 miles per hour with you. He wasn't trying to dampen down the action. No, the shock in Hagler Hearns is Thomas Hearns. Right? You mean to tell me a guy fought Marvin Hagler and from the opening bell tried to take the fight to Hagler? If you were alive in the mid-80s, you knew just that thought was downright ridiculous. Well, Tommy Hearns tried to take the fight to Marvin Hagler.
An argument can be made that that is the best fight either guy had in their entire careers. The first round is as good as it gets. You had another shock in that fight. Marvin Hagler getting cut and bleeding. You saw Hagler bleeding and you thought, what? What? This was in the middle. The middle of his multi-year championship reign. We hadn't seen Marvin Hagler, who was in bloody fights. That Vito Altafermo first fight was bloody. We'd seen Hagler in fights. Alan Minter's bleeding. Marvin Hagler had been in bloody fights. But the other fighter was the one who was always bleeding. In the Hearns fight, Hagler's bleeding. By his own admission after the fight, Hagler said he panicked. He started bleeding. He thought the ref might stop the fight. Now, his cut wasn't that bad. But let's just say, vintage Marvin Hagler. He's bleeding, so what does he do? He closes the show. Marvin goes across the ring right at the hitman. Talk about walking into a hurricane. Closes the show. Well, Hagler was the Boxing Writers Association of America's Fighter of the Year in 1983. Of course, that wasn't enough. So Marvin, of course, was the Boxing Writers Association of America's Fighter of the Year in 1985. How good was he? He was Boxing Illustrated's Fighter of the Decade. You might remember the decade as having Mike Tyson. Tyson did not win Boxing Illustrated's Fighter of the Year. This guy did. Let's talk a little bit about Styles because Hagler was an enigma. In the early part of the Minter fight, you'll hear Howard Cosell. By the way, that's how good it was. The film of that Hagler Minter fight. Cosell is doing the fight. So you're getting championship boxing and championship announcing. If you're of a certain age, you understood if it was a big fight, it was Cosell who you wanted. Right? Kind of like baseball and Vince Scully, if you're of another age. Well, let's just say they tell you Hagler was a natural southpaw. Yet, he looks inverted to me. Right? He looks like a righty fighting southpaw to me. Right? Just like we know Oscar De La Hoya was inverted. Lefty fighting right-handed stance. What do I mean by that? I mean Hagler's jab, his right jab, was a little bit too heavy. Didn't look like an offhand. Hagler's right hook, a little bit too heavy. Didn't look like an offhand. In fact, he starts the Ray Leonard fight. Hagler, the quick starter. Right? You remember him against Thomas the Hitman Hearns. You remember him against Alan Minter. Hagler, the quick starter. You remember him building up a lead on Vito Artefermo. For some reason, in the biggest fight of his career against a fighter who was loved, which Hagler wasn't, Hagler comes out against Ray Leonard, orthodox. Right now, we can debate this. This is what boxing's all about. You're at the pub, you're having a few drinks, and you're arguing over whether or not a fighter is righty or lefty. I think Hagler was inverted. I'm guessing a few people in life, his widow, might know what Marvin really was. Maybe Marvin was one of these kids who, you know, was ambidextrous. Right? But it's mystifying that Hagler would give away the first two rounds against Ray Leonard, who you understood even with three years out of the ring, still had legs. Right? Understand, if Marvin doesn't give away the first two rounds of that fight, he wins that fight. Well, understand, Hagler fought southpaw. I would question whether Hagler was a southpaw. As I said earlier, we remember him as collapsing the pocket and just trading with John DeBeast Mugabe and others. Right? As I said, only one guy before Ray Leonard during his championship run went the distance, and that was Duran. Well, let me just say this. 
right, against Iran, who was a master inside. Hagler stays outside for several rounds. You notice that? You notice that Artifermo fight, the first fight I'm talking about, not the second fight. You know, you fight Marvin Hagler a second time, you're asking for trouble, which is what Artifermo got. Got TKO'd in that second fight. But the first fight, wasn't Hagler getting roughed up deep in the pocket by Artifermo? Also, you think of Hagler as a slugger, right? The guy who withers you. Right? Hagler's getting hit with shots by Thomas the Hitman Hearns. Hearns even lands his right hand on Marvin Hagler. And that fight went less than four rounds. <laughs> right? That fight doesn't make it to the fourth round. But yet, there's Hagler boxing against Roberto Duran. In other words, ha Hagler is an enigma. I'm not sure exactly who he was, and I watched most of his career. You got the feeling Hagler knew how to fight. But it's impossible to look at the Duran fight and not come to the conclusion that Hagler knew how to box. Let me also say too, he fights Ray Leonard. And people loved Ray, right? It's a Manny Pacquiao thing where there's certain fighters who are loved. It's a Canelo thing. It's an Anthony Joshua thing. Right? It's an Ali thing. For whatever reason, the public falls in love with certain guys. In the 1980s, even though he hardly fought, he has an eye injury that keeps him out of the ring for several years. Even though, according to reports, he didn't train as hard as he should have. Ray Leonard was a womanizer, right? Don't fall for the older guy now who's kind of like viewed as a boxing professor on boxing telecasts. Ray Leonard was a guy running around town. Ray Leonard hung with an entourage, right? Ray Leonard had an old time trainer who understood how to deal with big personalities. Angelo Dundee, you might remember him. He used to be in Ali's corner, right? But life is what it is. And Ray Leonard was loved, was loved. But I want people to revisit the film of Hagler Leonard, one of the iconic fights. Now understand, if Marvin Hagler, who KO Thomas the Hitman Hearns, who beat Roberto Duran, who had beaten Ray Leonard, who had beaten countless others, John the Beast Mugabe, right? Keep in mind, Ray wasn't even a middleweight. Hagler had lived and dominated the middleweight division. Had Marvin Hagler beaten Ray Leonard, and it was his last fight, folks, he walks away at 32. An argument can be made that he is the fighter of the 1980s. I know he is, according to Boxing Illustrated, already. But understand, had he beaten Ray Leonard, he would have beaten Hitman, Duran, and Ray Leonard, right? The pride of the welterweight division, as well as the pride of the middleweight division. Right? We thought the world of John the Beast Mugabe. You didn't know who was going to win that Mugabe-Hagler fight, did you? Before it happened. And Marvin Hagler won it. Well, you know how it goes. Revisit the film. There are two schools of thought. This is one of those photo finishes in boxing. If you count the body shots, if you recognize that Marvin Hagler enters the ring as the middleweight champion who had not lost in several years, who had been the champion since 1980, doesn't Marvin Hagler win that fight? 
Now understand how mind-blowing that fight was. Ray Leonard had been out of the ring for three years. Right? Understand, one of the shocks of that fight was the idea that Ray Leonard went the distance with Marvin Hagler. That's how dominant Marvin was. By the way, let me point out too, that's how dominant the welterweight division was. Ray Leonard fought Duran at welter. Ray Leonard, I believe, fights Thomas the Hitman Hearns at welter. Understand, during Marvin Hagler's championship run, Alan Minter doesn't go the distance against Marvin Hagler. Only two guys do. Duran and Ray Leonard. That's how dominant they were. Think about Duran for a second, too. Duran is one of history's dominant lightweight champions. 135. He's in at 160 against Marvin Hagler and becomes the first man at 160 during Hagler's reign to go the distance against him. The 80s had some spectacular fighters. Simply spectacular. Well, that Ray Leonard, Marvin Hagler fight, was razor close. It easily could have gone either way. Easily. As it was Ray Leonard who was loved. Again, Manny Pacquiao, Anthony Joshua, Canelo got the decision. Marvin Hagler at 32 leaves the stage. The legacy he's left is a deep one. Understand for many years, for most of the 1980s, you knew he was the gold standard. The gold standard at middleweight. Very different than today. This isn't a situation where, and I'm just going to name some big fighters here. Let's put boxing under the microscope. Right? At welterweight, who's the king now? Is it Terrence Crawford? Is it Errol Spence? Do we know? 135 looks like it might have a dominant champion, Teofimo Lopez, certainly a highly skilled one. Folks, he's been champion at 135 for about three and a half minutes. Right? Just got there. Let's look at 168. That has a lot of big names right now. Canelo. Caleb Plant. Billy Joe Saunders, David Benavides. We're here arguing over who's the best at 168. You have Baturbiev. You have, I forget the other guy, but let's just say you have multiple guys at 175. Bivol. Right? Both unbeaten. At heavyweight, my favorite division, who is the king? You have the Anthony Joshua crowd. You have the Tyson Fury crowd. They're doing the dance that's commonplace in boxing today. Everyone wants to see the fight, so of course we're hearing that they're close to reaching a deal. It's just that we've been hearing that for too long. In the 1980s, when you talk about the middleweight division, there was no... Crawford and Spence. No, no, there was one crowd. The Marvin Hagler crowd. And it wasn't a crowd. It was a recognition. Oh, middleweight? That's Marvin Hagler's. The closest fighter to Marvin Hagler right now, and I see I lost my video. We'll still keep going. The closest person in boxing today to Marvin Hagler in terms of people just understanding the dominance saying, oh, that person owns that. Somebody is going to have to beat that person for me to consider them in the conversation. Is Clarissa Shields undisputed in two different weight classes?
Right? Well, understand. In the 1980s, Marvin Hagler was undisputed. Understand, he was fighting the biggest names out there. You want to know the difference between Marvin Hagler and Joshua and Tyson Fury? Ray Leonard was retired in the 1980s. Ray Leonard held a press conference. Marvin Hagler, who was busy fighting the Durans and the Thomas the Hitman Hearns of the world, attended the Ray Leonard press conference because Hagler wanted a fight with Ray Leonard. Hagler was so eager for his place in history that unlike today where fighters are hiding behind promoters and talking about fighting instead of fighting, where you have situations where, you know, Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua were talking about fighting years ago. Folks, that fight's expiration date has come and gone. You had the opposite with Marvin Hagler. Possible opponents were holding press conferences and Hagler was showing up to the press conference hoping to get a fight with the guy. Think about that. Hagler fights didn't linger. You didn't think, oh, is Hagler going to fight Thomas the Hitman Hearns? No, folks, these fights happened. Right, the stakes involved were as high as possible. IBF, WBA, WBC belts. Those were the big belts at the time. Those were the belts at stake when Hagler fought Roberto Duran. Right? There was no splitting. You know, there was nothing like today where Anthony Josh was saying, you know what, I'll, I'll give up a belt. I don't want to fight who's sick. I'll, uh, I'll give up a belt and not fight who's sick. That's not this guy. Marvin Hagler's fighting guys. All the belts are on the line in fight after fight. So forgive me. I'll just close with this about Hagler. Because Hagler to me is top of the mountain. Right? By the way, when Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao were trying to negotiate their fight, another fight that took too many years to negotiate, Marvin Hagler, who didn't give that many interviews, suddenly gave an interview. They were arguing over drug testing. Right? Floyd's point was simply, hey, I want a bilateral drug testing protocol. I'll submit to drug testing. I want Manny to submit to drug testing. Marvin Hagler, who was about getting fights done, and I disagree with Hagler on this, by the way, but Hagler, who was about getting fights done, gave an interview where he said, Floyd, make the fight happen. Don't worry about drug testing. This is the old school mindset. Your career is only so long. Get the fight done. Get in the ring. Make it happen. Offset whatever fake advantage the other guy has, whatever pharmaceutical advantage the other guy has with your game. Right? Hagler was all about getting fights done, and my goodness, was this guy a great fighter. The middleweight division had one of its absolute best as its champion from 1980 to 1987. He's no longer with us. He is sorely missed. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.